I can't I can't see easily who's the participants are. So yeah, yeah, it's good. Everyone's excited to learn about Nats. Who is this Nat? Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, then I'll get started. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Nat traversal today, which is a, a set of techniques for uh, allowing uh, two hosts that are each behind uh, Nat to uh, connect directly to each other uh, without having to hopefully without having to relay through a server. Sometimes you have to fall back to that, but we have options for that too. Um, so this is intended to enable uh, direct peer-to-peer -peer communication between hosts that are uh, both behind NATs. I'm going to ask this uh, first up. Was this inspired by Urbit chat? Um, <laughs> I first learned about this from people on Urbit, but I've been wondering about this for uh, quite a quite a lot longer than that. Uh, um, Urbit has very little of this implemented, actually, uh, which is one reason why people still have connectivity issues with it. Um, yeah, all right, cool. So um, we'll go over some preliminaries first. So um, I'm sure most people have a basic idea of what NAT is, um, some notion that it's how your uh, home Wi-Fi router lets you use one IP address with uh, um, one public IP address for multiple devices on a private subnet. But, uh, oh, I should say, first of all, um, a lot of what I learned was from this blog post over at uh, Tailscale is a company that does peer-to-peer -peer VPNs. And so they wrote a blog post on how they do NAT traversal and how it works. And that was very helpful. So um, I'll share the link in the chat after the talk is done. But if you want to go more in depth or just have a different uh, look over on this, then um, this is uh, a good read. And there, there's some more detail on some of the more advanced techniques here as well. Um, so we should discuss TCP and UDP because most NAT traversal stuff uses UDP. It is possible to do with TCP. It's more complicated. Uh, it's more tricky. My impression is that it works less of the time. Um, and the main reason for that is that TCP is stateful and NAT traversal more or less requires that you use the same socket to talk to some different hosts. So trying to munge that through with TCP is more challenging. Whereas with UDP, you could just say, okay, send messages over here. Oh, nope, send messages over here now. Um, network address translation itself is designed to let you use one or a few public IPs with um, to enable communication for an entire private subnet. So private subnets are um, IP ranges that are reserved by standard for private networks. So they're not to be used on the public internet. Um, I very rarely see the class B set the 172.16 prefix or the through 172.31. Uh, you'll see the 10 dot used quite a bit with uh, VPNs and larger corporate networks. And I'm sure everyone has seen on their home networks or when you get on uh, coffee shop Wi-Fi, seen the 192.168 prefix. So these are private. You These are not addressable from the internet. So what network address translation is going to do is it's going to keep a mapping um, mostly between pairs of its public IP address and a port and a private IP address and a port. And it's going to allocate those primarily based on packets routed that it routes for private uh, hosts on the private subnet. So a host on the private subnet is going to send a packet addressed to the internet. The NAT is going to route it, but it's going to allocate a port, rewrite the source of that packet to its public IP address and the port that it just allocated. And then it's going to keep a mapping from that port and um, from that port back to the private IP address and port that uh, it was originally sent from. And then when there's a return packet, it will know 
where to rewrite the destination of that packet to. So as far as your uh, your computer's networking stack is concerned, it is operating on the internet from a private IP address. But from the internet's perspective, this is all originating from your public IP address and the ports that the NAT is allocating. Um, some NATs, and we'll talk about this more in a second, some NATs will include in that mapping the remote, uh, the, dest the original destination IP address and port. That makes our life more difficult, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and we should be clear to what we're talking about here is what's called source NAT or SNAT. Um, this is um, where con communication is being initiated from a private network. Uh, there's also DNAT, and this is mostly things like load balancers. This is where you're getting packets in and you're picking from a list of available private hosts that you can send uh, a communication to, and then when they and then keeping a mapping so that they when they respond, you know which uh, client from the internet to send back to. Um, these don't actually cause a problem for peer-to-peer -peer connections for the most part, but SourceNAT does because you don't have a way for somebody on the public internet to address your host to initiate communication at all. So you have two hosts that uh, for, for a first pass, uh, nobody can initiate communication with. So how do they initiate communication with each other? Um, so we talked a little bit about whether that the, the remote hosts port mapping is included in the NAT's address. And so we have a name for when it doesn't, that's called endpoint independent mapping. And so the NAT is just allocating a port on its external interface that corresponds to a IP address and port on uh, the private network, uh, regardless of which host on the public internet you're communicating with. Subnats do what's called endpoint dependent mapping, where they will only route traffic for that external port from the host that was originally, the internet host that was originally being communicated with. That makes our life a good deal more difficult. And this is the primary case in which you will have to fall back to using a relay. Um, we should also clarify, um, people tend to conflate NATs and firewalls, and you can do NAT with firewall software. Um, IP tables in Linux can do network address translation. But for the purposes of this discussion, firewalls are for filtering packets, and NATs are actually messing with and translating packets. Um, firewalls also cause a little bit of a problem but not much of one. They're stateful, so if you have a side channel, which you'll need anyway, uh, for the peers to coordinate their direct communication. If they both start trying to talk to each other at once, that will open up that pipe because they'll both open up their firewall from the inside. Um, the, there's more detail about that at the beginning of that uh, blog post that I linked. Um, one more thing, you um, if you've looked into this before, you've probably seen uh, cone terminology for NAT that actually doesn't refer at all to the translation behavior, but just to the firewall behavior. So for the behavior that actually matters for how easily we're going to be able to connect, the endpoint independent versus endpoint dependent terminology is actually much more relevant. Does anyone have any questions before we go on? All of that was just... Uh, stuff that we'll need to know as we go into how we actually go about uh, setting up a peer-to-peer -peer connection across NAT. So I want to make sure that's clear for everyone. Um, sort of a simple question, but maybe important is, why do we want NATs? Why do we, why do we want to hide that information? Well, it's so um, some people do treat NATs as a security thing, and it is a little bit. I mean, making a host not directly addressable from the internet might increase your security a little bit. But the primary reason is that um, we've been reading for years about uh, IP version 4 address exhaustion. Um, so it's very hard to get an allocation of one IPv4 address per host. Um, and in fact, um, if you're on a home internet connection, you probably still get allocated 
and IP address for your connection. Uh, but you probably have several devices using it. If you're on a mobile device, it's likely that your mobile carrier has put a NAT in between you and your uh, um, put a NAT between you and your uh, uh, public internet connection. So you likely have an IP address, a private IP address that is then um, being translated to a public IP address. I know for a fact that this is the case for a lot of the cell modems um, that we use. But... A lot of uh, the cell modem stuff also uses IP uh, version 6 now. Oh, that's Yes, that's another good point. So NAT is... Um, the other thing that's done is NAT uh, is used to connect IPv6 only networks, again, uh, which happens quite a bit in the mobile setting, uh, to IP version 4, uh, the, the broader IPv4 internet. So if you have a host that only run a network that only runs IPv6, uh, you can use NAT to, um, and that, that's called uh, 6 to 4 NAT. Any other questions? All right. Um, so let's go on to how we actually get through NATs. So quick, what's your public IP address? Better question. Quick, how would you programmatically determine your internet-facing IP address? I go uh, to ident.me and I told <laughs> right. right. Yeah. You have a curl command to uh, Google and then right. parse the results. Yeah. Right. What is my IP.com? Thanks very much. Yes, exactly. Um, so, um, so the, and that's the, that's the basic idea is that you need a, a known external server to observe what your public IP address is and then send that back to you as the body of a message. So there's actually a protocol for this that not only will tell you your external IP address, but also what port you are communicating from. So you then know what, um, what IP address and port your NAT has allocated. And if you're endpoint independent, then suddenly you have a, for the next several seconds, at least, if you can keep that connection alive, you have a, uh, um, a public IP address and a port allocated on it that you can communicate through. So uh, there's a protocol called STUN, Session, session Traversal Utilities for NAT. Uh, and the basic idea is this, the server sits on the public internet, it gets a UDP packet and it replies to it. And in the body, it puts the source IP and port that it observed from the original UDP uh, packet. And that's mostly it. The nuance is um, there's a little bit of extra to try to observe whether you're actually doing endpoint dependent mapping. And um, there is also some stuff because some old NATs would actually do a find and replace on the uh, with the mapping table, not just for the destination IP field on return packets, but on the entire packet. And so if you put the source IP and port in the body, then they would rewrite that as well. So stun includes some stuff to essentially include a random identifier with your message and then uh, XOR the observed IP address with your uh, with that random identifier so that your NAT doesn't uh, recognize it and mess with it. Um, but that's basically it. And so, like I said, if you're not as endpoint independent, you have a known external IP import, well, you know it, and a mapping uh, in, from your, in your NAT from that port back to your internal IP import. So now you can s uh, send and receive UDP packets from a known uh, external IP and port. Another way to achieve this same result is if your router supports one of the um, multicast protocols for uh, port allocation. Uh, 
the original one uh, was uh, Universal Plug and Play. Uh, there's a profile for UPnP, uh, which you may also have used in the context of like having your iTunes share its library with other iTunes on the same network. Um, so UPnP is a multicast protocol where it uh, broadcasts packets on the local network and tries to find other hosts that will respond and say, hey, I match this protocol. So there is a, pro a profile for uh, routers to respond and say, hey, I'm your router. Uh, and for you to then say, hi, can you please open up a UDP port for me on the external internet side? And for the router to say, yes, by the way, this is the external IP address and this is the port. So this achieves the same thing, but with your router giving you that information directly rather than you having to ping off an external server. Uh, there's two newer protocols that achieve the same sort of thing. The primary issue with this is that UPnP in its original incarnation had a lot of security holes and all the big internet security experts told people to turn off UPnP on their routers. Um, most routers, which support any of these protocols, put them all in their little web config UI under a switch that says UPnP. And so people go and turn that off. And so, so now none of these are supported. But if you're writing peer-to-peer -peer software, you can at least try this. And if people are having connectivity trouble, you can tell them, hey, go turn that switch back on. Um, for endpoint dependent NATs, like I said, a lot of times that involves just giving up, but there is a technique that involves you opening, say, 100 ports using stun, and then asking your peer to essentially birthday attack the NAT, start trying random ports, and hope that the birthday paradox means that very quickly they find one of the ones that's open. Uh, that The problem with that is that if it's not your NAT, but somebody else's NAT, it can look like you just instigated a, uh, a port scanning attack against them. Uh, but that is that is a technique that is used sometimes. Does anyone have it? So those are the basic techniques for trying to to punch through and get direct peer-to-peer -peer connections uh, um, through a NAT. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I go on and talk a little bit about relaying connections? So uh, from what I understand here, is it is it like um, basically from the both sides are opening a port? on the public IP and figuring out what it is so that they can both talk to each other through it? That's, 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 that's correct. Um, it, these are all techniques for you to find out what your public IP address is and what port you have open. Um, we'll see in a little bit how you actually get that information over to your peer so they know how to talk to you. But this is for you to figure out how somebody could talk to you. Does that make sense? This doesn't actually handle connection setup with your peer yet. It just makes it possible in theory because now you have a public IP address and port pair for your socket. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so, so this is finding a path. Um, you know, uh, what if there's, uh, I guess, what if there's a, like a, a better path? Um, is there any, is there any consideration for that? Or is it just always, once we get the first, the first thing we can find, we just call that good enough. So this is what, these are just, uh, this, um, uh, t hole punching techniques. Okay. We'll talk about, uh, exchanging path with your peer and uh, best path discovery a little bit later. But okay. the answer is yes, yes, we do in fact take that into consideration. But that's, um, again, right now we're just worried about how can we get a public IP address and port for ourselves that then somehow our peer could find out about and connect to. Awesome. Um, so this is, a, this is a short section, which is to say um, 
Uh, sometimes none of this works. There's a lot of different gnats out there. Some of them are friendly. Some of them aren't. Some of them are just buggy. Um, but they all more or less allow communication to a public server on the public internet. So if you can't establish direct peer-to-peer -peer connection, you might need to use a relay. So there's another protocol uh, called TURN, uh, traversal using relays around NAT. Um, and TURN is essentially a mechanism that lets you allocate a couple of ports on a server um, using authentication, because this is going to put some bandwidth load on the server, unlike Stun, where it's a single UDP packet exchange. and a lot of people just run public stun servers. Uh, this actually, all your your entire communication is going to get fed through here. So it's authenticated, and you wind up with uh, a port on this external server that you can send traffic to that will come out the port on the other port that's allocated. And then your peer should send traffic to the other port that was allocated, and that will get sent through the first port and back to you. Um, stun and turn can be combined on the same server. They The protocol specs are actually uh, combined. And uh, there's uh, software called CoTurn that acts as, uh, it's open source software that uh, acts as a stun and turn server, um, has nice uh, ways to allocate authentication tokens, things like that. So. Um, so this is something where you can put it up on a cloud server and say, oh, I have a stun and turn server more or less ready to go. So now we'll get to uh, Scott's question, which is, OK, how do we find out about all of these paths? And also, everything we've talked about tells us how someone else could talk to us. But how do we tell the person we're trying to connect to how to talk to us? And um, how do we find out which of these techniques has actually been successful? All of these are sort of best effort techniques. So how do we find out which, if any, of these actually gets us talking to someone? Um, and this is where ICE comes in. So ICE is probably. Um, ICE and STUN are what everyone has heard of when looking into this a little bit. Uh, you might have, um, in the settings for some video game, had to configure STUN servers, or maybe if you've set up SIP phones, you've had to set up STUN servers. Um, so uh, it can be a little bit confusing when you're first reading about to try to understand the relationship, also because some documentation is a little bit... Uh, loose with the terminology and uses ICE servers as sort of a catch-all uh, term for stun and turn servers. So ICE servers, there's no separate ICE server per se. You have stun servers and turn servers, and both of those produce IP and port pairs that you could be communicated with via. So ICE is a protocol for how you encode candidates for how someone could talk to you. And once you have gathered these candidates and exchanged them with the peer you're trying to talk to, the protocol spec says essentially, try everything and figure out which is the best. So here's the, uh, the underpants gnomes part of the talk. We talked about exchanging candidates with our peer. The whole point of this is that we're trying to set up communication with the peer. So how do we exchange these candidates? And the answer is you need some kind of side channel. This isn't, this isn't uh, <laughs> cheating because what we're trying to do is set up direct peer-to-peer -peer communication and it's okay if at the very beginning, we use, or whenever we need to reestablish communication, we use a more centralized uh, form of communication just to get that off the ground and set up. 
Uh, very commonly, this is a, a web server with a REST API that can handle um, authenticating peers to each other and exchanging their candidate information. But there's other ways you can do this. Um, Shulhi, can you go ahead and share your screen too? And I'm going to come away from. Uh, okay. I'm going to come away from my slides, and I'm going to share my terminal window as well. Hopefully, this is. So I'm actually I'm going to share. We're going to do the demo first, and I'm going to show you. Um, what the the code for what we're actually doing uh can everyone see both shulhi's screen and my screen just yours i can only see one at a time okay really? hmm. um okay well so shulhi is going to be doing essentially the same thing i'm doing so if people can see side to side that's great um Zoom appears to make it a little difficult to actually do that. But if if people are able to see it, then. Um, so I'm going to blow this up a little bit so you can all see. So um, I'm going to run uh, two IO actions. And Shulhi's going to do this more or less simultaneous with me. The first one is this function is going to allocate a UDP socket, and then it's going to talk to a stun server. Uh, I've hard coded it to be uh, Google's main stun server, which um, is stun.l.google.com port 19302. And um, then when I do this, um, Shulhi and I are going to quickly verbally exchange. So we're going to use the Zoom call as that side channel. We're going to verbally exchange the IP address and uh, port pairs we got. And we're going to, we're going to see uh, if all goes well, we're going to see some indication that we're actually uh, talking directly to each other. So the second function I run is just going to start two threads, one of which will throw UDP packets at Shulhi. And the other will listen for UDP packets from him and uh, print out when they're received. OK, so okay, Shulhi, so yeah, go ahead. OK. And then, uh, so oh, sorry, sock IP port from stun socket. And I'll just have a socket hanging um, So I need your IP. Yeah, so my IP is 69. Two three five. Six, six nine. Two three five. Five zero. Two one four. Five zero. Two one five four. zero. Two one four. And the port is three three seven eight. Three. Three three seven eight three. And um, so now I need your IP address. Oh, can you see my screen? I cannot. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot, sorry. Hi. <laughs> so my IP is 60, 52, 59, and 83. And, and the port is 44192. Oh, I have to give it the socket as well. OK, so if Shulhi's running this and I'm running this, then in a short time, are you running the peer ping, Shulhi? Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. There we go. So Shulhi is sending UDP packets to me, and I'm sending UDP packets. Are you set, Are you seeing the got response on your end too, Shulhi? Mm -hmm. I got, got response for. Yep, and I as well. So Shulhi and I are directly exchanging UDP packets from behind a NAT. Um, so this is this is an easy case because we're both running. Uh, I assume his is also fairly new NAT. Um, most newer NATs, especially home NATs, are endpoint independent, which makes this easy. Endpoint dependent 
gnats tend to be things that um, that blog post says the more it advertises itself as a security device so something like a, a Barracuda networks or um, something like that I would imagine would uh, be more likely to have that behavior. Uh, you could go ahead and kill that now, Shulhi. I'm going to. Um, okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. I'm going to pull up the code here. OK, so what actually happened there? This first bit of code. Um, goes ahead and allocates a socket. Um, this first block is just looking up the host name uh, for um, for the Google Stun server. So we go ahead and allocate a socket that's, uh, if we say AF, INET, and Datagram, it's a UDP socket. Um, when you say connect on a UDP socket, it doesn't actually go through any kind of sending or state transition like TCP because it's stateless. It just sets the socket so that the default place to send and send to and receive from is uh, the address in question. So having done that, um, we send somebody has a somebody's keyboard is clicking through their microphone. Having done that, we uh, the send binding function sends the request packet up to the UDP or up to the stun server and uh, sends a response. This is from uh, the Haskell stun library that I found on GitHub. Um, and then you could see we can either get a mapped IP address or we can get an XOR mapped IP address um, if it needed to obscure it from our NAT. But in either case, uh, we get a IP address and a port back from the stun server. And this function will just return those along with the socket because we're going to want to use the same socket then bound to the same, uh, the same uh, ephemeral port on our local machine to, uh, to go ahead and do the communication with the peer. So then this is extremely simple. It just takes the socket. Um, we put in the remote IP address. So whichever IP address Shulhi got, I plugged in here and the remote port number. Uh, we start two threads. One of them starts uh, throwing packets with OX dead beef at the remote host every five seconds. The other one waits for packets, checks that the body equals dead beef, and then updates a counter and prints out that it was received. If it doesn't match, it points out that it doesn't match. So um, hopefully that gives people, so in a, in a real, um, in a real setting, you would not verbally exchange these obviously, but you would uh, have some programmatic way of exchanging a whole bunch of uh, IP address and port pairs and then trying all of them. So I have, I have a question. When you send, when you send a message, uh, do, do you have to limit the message size to the packet size or, or, the, uh, or the packet fragment will be automatically done? Um, you can, so with UDP, there is auto fragmentation, I believe, but there's no help in reassembling or reordering. You have to handle that at the application, uh, layer. So if you send a message that's too big for your MTU, uh, I believe the UDP spec specifies fragmenting the packet, but there's not any help in figuring out which one should go first. So you do, like, if you're writing a real protocol over UDP, you do want to work hard to determine uh, what's called your MTU, your maximal tr maximum transmissible unit over your path. And uh, 
keep your messages under that and then you need to build logic for um if you need ordered communication or uh any kind of message reassembly you want to make sure to uh um make sure that you build that in at the application layer but but the mtu can be different from my endpoint and your endpoint right so well, I MT, a low and mtu is a function of a path between two endpoints so yes oh, it I could see. be different for you talking to me versus you talking to somewhere else but it's a function of it's the essentially the lowest mtu of any link on the path um, and it's sort of something you have to discover dynamically. Yeah, and like an MTU, right, is like the size of the packets being sent, correct? It's, it's the so, the maximum size of a packet you could send over a link or a path, yes. Yeah. Um. Uh, we're about to blow up here in 30 seconds, 40 sure. seconds or so. Um, so I just want to say quickly, this adds security worries. You really, your protocol needs to use CAs or exchange keys through a secure side channel. Um, this is not something where you say, eh, security will do it later. Shilhi and I obviously weren't for the demo, but for any real application that you need to do that. Anything else? I I think uh, WireGuard works a lot like this. Um, well, WireGuard is a point-to-point -point protocol, but there are things built on top of WireGuard that let you uh, use it over 